Hi, I'm Paul J. Welcome to the analysis.news. I'll be back in a second with part two of My Reality Asserts Itself with Matt Taibbi. And please don't forget the donate button. Hi, welcome to part two of Reality Asserts Itself with Matt Taibbi. Matt's the author of four New York Times bestsellers and award-winning columnist for Rolling Stone. His reporting and commentary on TK News is among the top five for numbers of subscribers on Substack. And sometimes I think he's at the top of Substack. His podcast, Useful Idiots, co-hosted with Katie Halper, is wildly popular. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Hi, Paul. Let's keep the history going for a bit. What year do you leave? I left in 2002. Oh, you're there all through the rise of Putin then? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, oh well. Yeah, we we and I was I was close friends with uh, well I was friends with a lot of the the reporters who were really initially quite negative about Putin. The Russians, you know, they were, we had no illusions about what he was early. It was interestingly a lot of the Western reporters did. Uh, if you look back, you'll see that there were a lot of stories about how. Um, you know, being in the KGB wasn't necessarily a bad thing, that the, it was just a, a, a profession that upper middle class people went into in the 70s in the Soviet Union. And um, he was a refined, cultured, educated person who, you know, with whom we could, a man with whom we could do business. Um, but we knew we knew right away that he was going to be a step in a different direction. And uh, we did a lot of reporting on that. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because you know the interviews I've done uh, with with people f in today's Russia uh, who are very critical of Putin, but also see his rise as something that w was frankly necessary. That the chaos of the '90s, there had to be somebody that can construct a viable state. And, oh, absolutely, yeah. And and he was absolutely a reaction against what was happening. So the the Yeltsin was essentially a puppet of sort of Western backed interests, right? I mean, he, he posed as a Russian populist uh, and a man of the people. He was very, he, he had this uh, sort of every man quality that some Russians thought was very attractive. He was, you know, he drank a lot, uh, but really he was there to be a, sort of a typical front person for neoliberal politics. And that wasn't working for Russia. Like, you know, the country was really going downhill. And Putin, I don't think in, in many respects, he wasn't better, uh, but he at least kept the stolen money in the country. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Russians viewed him as something like, you know, they, they would say like, yeah, he's corrupt, but he's nosh, right? That, that, in, in Russian, that means he's ours. Um, mm -hmm. So there was, there was a sense that, the Russians were getting their own autonomy, even if it wasn't, even if the it was becoming more repressive. Uh, so yeah, I totally understand the point of view. And there was more, a little bit more prosperity too when he came when he came along. So uh, you know, in, in the course of this, we'll jump back and forth from the present to back then. So, uh, what, what do you make of this demonization of Putin now? He's, he's you know he's as close to the foreign devil as you can get in American politics. I mean, it's it's so funny because he's gone back and forth between being, you know, the the symbol of absolute evil and somebody we can do business with and somebody who's pragmatically going to be our partner in the war on terror. And he's been exactly the same person the entire time. It's been the Western um, you know, sort of image of him that's that's changed multiple times uh, since he's come to power. Uh, but he's he's been the same guy who you know, uh, where, you know, journalists, uh, are routinely attacked. And, you know, I knew a couple who got assassinated, um, you know, while I was there and, uh, that's been true from the very beginning. I, I, I think this, obviously I've written a lot about the Russia gate story. Um, I think he's just been a, a convenient foil who just happened to be there when there were some developments in American politics that required the presence of a, of some kind of foreign enemy, and he stepped into the shoes of, you know, Milosevic, Saddam Hussein, you know, wh whoever the the Hitler of the week is in American politics. He's now he he plays that role now. And what truth is there to that depiction of him? Well, he certainly 
he's certainly every bit the repressive um well maybe not every bit uh, he, he but he's he's certainly uh you know the the issue with political freedom uh the thievery all of those things are i think uh if not 100 percent true in the ballpark of true there are some i i'm not so sure though how much the uh the idea of russia as this uh chaos like superpower that is uh you know deeply enmeshed in the affairs of every western country from um you know england to the united states to france i don't know how much that's true russia is still comparatively a pretty weak country compared to the united states its entire economy could fit inside um, south korea or new york state uh it's got a big military but it's it's nowhere near on the level of China in terms of its actual power. Um, so some of that I think is stagecraft. The, you know, Putin's just sort of been built up in the American media as this all-powerful figure, and um, I don't I don't think that's true. I also think that there are aspects of the Russia Gate story that just aren't don't coincide with reality. Yeah, I've I've always my line's been from the beginning, even if. Russia is guilty of every single thing they're charged with. One, we should thank them for exposing what happened at the DNC and the undermining of the Sanders campaign. And, and two, whatever they did to quote unquote undermine American democracy, it doesn't compare with, to what the American oligarchy has done to American democracy. I mean, it, it's, it's such a, distract, such a distraction. Uh, I, I was there in 1996 and we openly meddled in the Russian presidential election. If you go back and look at Time magazine in July of 1996, you'll see um, you see a picture of Yeltsin holding a flag and it's and the headline is Yanks to the Rescue. We had American advisors working in the Kremlin um, and we spent millions of dollars we funneled to sort of pro-democratic organizations in Russia that basically ended up paying for commercials for Yeltsin and his run against Gennady Zudaganov. Uh, Putin would end up closing up shop for a lot of those organizations later. So yeah, the hypocrisy is kind of ridiculous. So you compare that to what is it? $46,000 in Facebook ads. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a silly thing. Yeah. I don't know if there's a country in the world in, in the most of the 20th century and this century where the United States hasn't directly gotten involved in the elections, including Canada. I, I, I just very quickly, it was, it was Kennedy that set, sent the pollster Lou Harris with a phony passport and a phony name to Ottawa to run Lester Pearson's election campaign because because they wanted to overthrow Diefenbaker because Diefenbaker wouldn't allow nuclear armed Bomark missiles into Canada. And they succeeded. Pearson became the prime minister and in came the Bomark missiles. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the hypocrisy is beyond belief. But but even if you forget the hypocrisy, the significance of whatever the Russians did or didn't do is just so irrelevant to the outcome of any of this. So. But 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 let me just add one thing as a, partly a question too. The way the Democratic Party used this was to evoke all the demons of the Cold War, and and blow this all out of significance because they thought this would sink Trump. And, and it, it's a quite interesting that right wing base of Trump wasn't couldn't care less about it all. Yeah, it, I mean, it was so it was so overtly phony um, that I, I think it had. a. It, it's interesting because it worked for the Democrats, like the Democratic voters were very impressed by that, that propaganda campaign. But the 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 confusion was incredible. I mean, Donna Brazil was saying things like the communists are dictating the terms of the debate. Uh, they were, everybody was, was tweeting hammers and sickles. Like they didn't understand that the, there was no longer a Soviet union. There was the whole concept that there was spreading everywhere that Donald Trump had been recruited uh, in the eighties or the seventies by the KGB. And people would say that and never bring up the fact that this was a different country and, you know, maybe the security services had different people. So but you're right. The right wingers didn't tune into that, partly because I think it was their guy and they, did, they didn't believe it. But also because I think the the nobody really buys modern Russia as the same kind of enemy that the that the Soviet Union was. And for good reasons. Uh, again, the Soviet Union was was a massive superpower compared to 
today's Russia. So I think it, it made sense that it didn't work. You wrote an article recently, which I'm a fan of, which critiqued Rachel Maddow, and partly on this whole point. Uh, it's kind of the, the way she comes from the supposed kind of left of the Democratic Party, although in reality, she's certainly been more Obama, more Clinton than Sanders. In fact, she's probably been anti-Sanders. But, but it's interesting how popular she's become, and to most large extent because of her Russiagate stuff. Yeah, and... You know, again, you asked me before about whether my politics have changed. And what I've seen is that this, you know, what used to be the kind of left leaning or progressive media landscape has suddenly become, has stepped into the same role that, that Fox News used to have, uh, or and, and still does to some degree. But, you know, you think about the Bush years when Fox was so jingoistic and was so ag aggressive about it's, uh, you know, portrayal of, of uh, the foreign enemy. Uh, and it was constantly sort of hyping uh, a, a very aggressive military uh, posture towards whether it was Iraq or uh, Iran or some other, you know, any, any foreign nation that got in our way during the war on terror. Um, and that's what MSNBC does now. They, they you know, you, you turn on the television and everything's about Russia, uh, whether it was the 2020 Democratic primaries where they constantly evoked it to talk about Tulsi Gabbard or, or, or Sanders. There was the Afghan bounty story last year. Uh, they were always talking about Russian trolls and flaming this thing or that thing. And it's, it's just become a foil that we use to try to, you know, I think clamp down on uh, opposition thinking and dissidents in this country. And I, I don't see that as left at all or progressive. I see that as um, very regressive and uh, and jingoistic. Well, it's outright McCarthyite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's 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 been kind of amazing to watch people who you would think would have a lot of sensitivity to that because the the progressive, I would say, intellectual tradition that was such a part of you know sort of my upbringing was being sensitive to you know, those kinds of themes, right? So whether you're talking about the Manchurian candidate or, or you're, um, you know, watching movies like Guilty by Suspicion or, you know, anything that has to do with McCarthyism was like, that was the number one villain of progressive thinking growing up. Uh, and now suddenly it's it's become a thing that we're not necessarily against. It's, it's just very odd to me. Is, is, is there also a little problem? I shouldn't say little, if, if I'm right, it's more than a little problem. But on the critics of Russiagate, some are uh, come down to acting almost like what I would say apologists for Putin. And here's the problem. Uh, demonizing Putin is more, in my opinion, more dangerous than being an apologist for Putin. So let me start from there, because being an apologist for Putin doesn't lead to feverish hysteria that could lead to nuclear war. So, so you know, while I don't think any, I don't want to be involved in any apology for Putin, the demonization of Russia is far more dangerous to the world. That said, Putin's involved in some, not just domestic repression, uh, he's involved in encouraging the far right in Europe. And he certainly encouraged the rise of Trump and the far right in the United States. And I, I think that needs to be said too. And I, I find sometimes the critics of Russiagate don't want to don't want to go there. Yeah, I I get that. Uh, I my attitude has always been that I I just think Putin's irrelevant to our domestic discussion. I mean he he's he's a probably a minor factor in in American politics. Um, but you know, I don't I certainly don't want to come across as somebody who's pro Putin. I mean I, I was very critical of him from the start. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting you are. I'm. I'm not. I'm, not, I'm actually not including you in what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah no. I know. I understand what you're saying. I, I think. Um, yeah. Th there's. The, it, it's a fine line, right? Because you don't want to come across as as a uh, you know de demonizing this this sort of uh, sort of foreign bogeyman figure because that's it's such a familiar trope in American media and, and I, I hate to go there because it's such a not only is it a cliche it's a kind of a destructive cliche that we regularly indulge in um, but he's not a good guy I mean there's no question about that and and the the um, you know the the influence on 
uh, sort of American politics, or at least his his type of politics, be having lots in common with other right wing movements and, and and even Trump. There's there's a danger there that I think you know people who are in the United States need to understand, which is that Putin is a reaction to very poor policies by uh, by Yeltsin in the 90s. There was a there was a desire for order and stability. And, and very much encouraged by the United States. I mean, shock therapy was American idea, not Yeltsin's idea. Absolutely. I mean, in, in, in so many ways, I, I think Putin was a preview of what the Trump phenomenon was all about. And that's... Um, you know, he happened for a reason, right? Like, I, this is this has been my criticism of American media with, with Trump, is that, yes, you can say all these terrible things about them. They're all true. But you have to understand why people voted for him. And they voted for him because the country was kind of a mess. There was a tremendous lack of attention to what ordinary people were going through. Uh, there was a lack of faith in institutions. You know, I think that was something that was very true in Russia in the 90s as well. And so there was this desire for somebody to just come in and kind of put things right, right? And Putin promised to do that. Trump very much did the same thing. You know, leave it to me. I alone can handle it. These are very Putin-esque themes. Uh, and you can you can recognize that and understand that and diagnose it without, without also believing the conspiracy theory at the same time. You mean that there was some direct collaboration in the election and all that? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, 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 if that's I, true, I, I, need, I need more to go on, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I never got into the real specific weeds of this. Uh, as far as I could see, there was nothing to go on. Uh, but I also thought I couldn't care less because even if there was, it was it, it didn't determine any outcome. It was so irrelevant. Right, uh, that's what Chomsky's position was on the whole thing from the start. Yeah, I agree with him. Uh, this, this critique of the shutting down of voices, the censorship that's going on in high tech, uh, the critique you were making, uh, the, the Russiagate stuff. Uh, while I, uh, you know, I'm in agreement with all of that critique and, and I've been saying the same stuff. I don't know who's listening, but I've been saying the same stuff for years. Um, but I, I, would, I would never, what I would say, I guess just to be straightforward about it, I wouldn't go on Tucker Carlson and say any of that stuff. Uh, I think that's crossing a line where I, I back up. I'm not saying don't go on Tucker Carlson. I'd go on Tucker Carlson five nights a week if he had me. But I would critique Trump and I would critique the Democrats. I wouldn't just say what Tucker wants to hear so I get invited back on. What, what, do, what do you think of that? Well, I haven't been on Tucker. Uh, so I, I've had kind of a policy about Fox always. Um, it's not that I wouldn't go on. I think I'm, I think my feeling is, is kind of like yours there. And I, I, know, I know, I understand who you're talking about. Um, I also understand, Glenn, you know, the argument of people like Glenn, Glenn Greenwald, which is, you know, one of the things that people leave out about that is that he's been kind of frozen out of American, uh, of other cable stations. It's not like he's been drowning in green room in, invites from, CNN and MSNBC and uh, and all those networks. Neither have I, by the way. Like ever since the Russian story has been has started, uh, none of us have been invited on. So, you know, I I I, I kind of understand the thought process of well, they're not going to let me on here, and uh, this is a way to reach my audience, and I'm not saying anything that I don't believe in. Um, it's a difficult question. I, you know, I, I I can see both sides of it. Uh, you know, I've obviously taken a, a different approach, but uh, but I can see both sides. Yeah, I'm a little more critical of it. I, I, I don't make a big thing out of it because I so appreciate everything Glenn does otherwise that I I don't make a big deal out of it. But I, I, all of us have been shut out. I mean, Thomas Frank used to be on uh, all the time, and he's not on, not because of Russia Gate, he's because of his critique of the Democratic Party and the corporate leadership. He doesn't get invited on anymore. There, there's um, a whole slew of people who haven't been invited on for a whole host of bizarre reasons. And some, some of them are the, like the most famous people in our business. Uh, and they've just been kind of like left by the wayside. I became pretty good friends with Gore Vidal. I knew him for the last two, three years and interviewed him of his life and interviewed him a bunch of times. And there was no more famous left liberal voice than his. And in the last years of life, his life, he was shut out. 
I mean, you go from 1968, where he's doing this debate with Buckley Jr. during the Democratic Party convention, and he's that prominent to he doesn't get invited on anywhere except European television. Well, I mean, I, I, to me, modern day MSNBC is closer to being in the politics of Bill Buckley than it is to being in the politics of Gore Vidal. It's it's become patrician, upper class, uh, cosmopolitan. I mean, that that's sort of the vision of uh, sort of modern neoliberal politics is is more, you know, an Ivy League upper class uh, type of politics. And, you know, except that the, it, it's a different look. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's very much in that vein. But people who are actually kind of um, hardcore progressives or, or idealistic, they just tend not to make it on TV that much anymore. Yeah. Uh, go back to some of the biographical stuff. So you're there till 2002 and you come back to the U.S., um, how, how do you break in at Rolling Stone? Because you wind up being one of the better known, you know, progressive media personalities in the country by what, 07, 08 anyway. So yeah, Rolling Stone had done a story about my newspaper, um, in 1998 or nine. So the editors had an eye on me from that time. And when I came back to the country, uh, in 2002, uh, I guess it was 2003, they gave me a call and uh, gave me sort of a tryout to write about the, the presidential campaign uh, that season. And uh, it worked out and they gave me a job. And that was my first kind of square job in journalism. And I, I stayed with them until, you know, about a month ago, basically. Uh, and I loved it there for a long time. It was it was a great period in the magazine's history. And, um, and my, my career kind of took off when the financial crisis happened in 2008 and they somewhat randomly assigned me to do a finance story and I ended up spending like 10 years on that and um, it was th that was an incredible challenge and uh, and really interesting and, and a weird a weird turn for the magazine too uh, but it it worked out great yeah that's that's when you crossed my radar so how much does your coverage of the looting of the uh, what had been the Soviet economy inform your understanding of, of the 0708 crash. To totally, it was the the, the 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 stories were so similar. Um, just a tiny bit of background: what happened in in ninety six and ninety seven in Russia was that uh, a gang of sort of plutocratic banking interests uh, agreed to funnel uh, lots and lots of revenue to Boris Yeltsin in exchange for preferential treatment at the privatization auctions of big oil and mineral concerns. So basically Yeltsin made uh, oligarchs overnight uh, out of some of these big uh, you know, sort of private business figures. And that concept of this interrelationship between the extremely wealthy and political um, a monetary influence, right? These guys who are funneling money to uh, to the Yeltsin government in exchange for sort of regulatory relief and turning the other way on crimes and that sort of thing. All of that came into play with with the crash in 08. Uh, all these banks were intimately connected with the American government, and then they, you know, they they got bailouts and they got regulatory relief in the form of you know not being prosecuted for crimes, and it was very much the same story. Uh, it was just a little bit more sophisticated on a much bigger scale in America. <laughs> um, what what were your main sort of discoveries of that crisis in terms of the dynamic of how it worked? So I, I, I struggled with it at first because it was uh, it was pretty technical. And I, re I remember talking to a banker, a, a guy who worked in the in the industry early, and he said, you your problem is that you're looking at this as a finance story. It's a crime story. Uh, and once you get that, you'll get it. And he was absolutely right. Uh, once I started looking at it as a um, as a fraud scheme, which is what it was, it was basically the banks were selling uh, things that really weren't valuable mortgages as as AAA rated investments. One, once you got that basic nut of it, the rest of it was just jargon and, uh, you know, and language that had to be learned like like a foreign language. And, and um, 
And so it, that, that was the great insight, <laughs> which was that the, even the, these very big, sophisticated banks, which drape everything they do in this uh, in sort of grandiose language, actually, when you get down to it, it's, they're just pretty grubby little crime schemes. Yeah, I just in the midst of doing a series of interviews with Bill Black, uh, you know, who covers this. And uh, I, you know, I keep I, several times I would ask, say, well, I don't get this. Why would you get appraisers to over appraise a house? How's that good for the bank? And he'd say, Paul, it's not the banks, it's the bankers. That, that it's the bankers making the fees and it's the bankers that are profiting from the fraud, not the institutions as much, although some of the institutions came out pretty well too. Yeah, and also they were they ended up usually se selling those notes on to a third party pretty quickly. So even if they even if they were taking on something that was overvalued, what they would do is they would turn it into a security and dump it on you know, an insurance company or a pension fund. So the, the people who ended up owning the bad thing, the bad property was, you know, were people who were retired and were just, just had retirement accounts. You know, I, I'm not sure how much this has been analyzed or talked about, but it just occurs to me. The fact that the leading, the leaders of Wall Street got away without and out fraud, and they are not, did they not only not go to jail, they are still most of them the leaders of Wall Street. Um, they are still most of them the ones that determine the uh, Treasury Department's policies both in both parties, uh, but very much so the Democratic Party. Um, it was it's kind of a, a a qualitative shift, I guess, in the power of finance and, and the character of the Democratic Party. For sure, the, you know the I would say the Democrats started to be. Um sort of infiltrated by that in the Clinton years. You saw people like Bob Rubin come on board. There was this new type of uh, person that kind of appeared in the scene, and that was the Wall Street CEO who was socially liberal, but uh, but politically, you know, economically still very, very conservative and sort of laissez-faire. And they started to be very prevalent in the Clinton government. They helped repeal the Glass-Steagall Act in the late 90s. Uh, and then, you know, by the mid 2000s, late 2000s, the, you know, the Goldman Sachs was Barack Obama's number one private campaign uh, contributor. So there was a lot of banking money. There were a lot of Citicorp people in the, in the Obama government, um, and, sorry, Citigroup. And uh, yeah, the, the, this, this intertwining of Wall Street interests with the Democratic Party, that it hasn't, it hasn't been undone yet. There's still quite a lot of that going on which is why you ha you haven't seen a lot of regulatory action in that arena um, you know since they've been in power. So well I I know you we only have so much time so I'll kind of bring us up into the current moment and I hope another time we can dig more into history. Um, so so far what are you making in in this context of the Biden administration both in terms of is there going to be any kind of serious regulation of Wall Street uh, is this infrastructure plan uh, does it have any kind of progressive character or is it simply something Wall Street's going to find a way to cash in on? Uh, I know I just went through the plan with Bob Poland, the, the economist from Perry, and we were both kind of astounded that one of the most important things that one that could be done in terms of climate change is retrofitting buildings. But in the statement explaining what's in this big infrastructure plan, Unless I misread it or there's a typo. I didn't misread it. It says they're going to do 2 million houses. I mean, that's not like 2 million. Is, that's not even a, a mid-sized, or maybe it's a mid-sized city, but it sure ain't the country. Like it's the most effective thing they could do on climate change. The biggest thing they could do to create jobs uh, is, 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 is symbolic. Well, right. You're also in Canada, and and you know you're used to those kinds of politics being real in in America. <laughs> oh no no I no oh, no 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 no. First of all, I lived the last 12, 15, 14 years in the U.S. And number two, there ain't nothing real about Canadian environmental politics. Nothing. We're the country of the tar sands. But go on. <laughs> okay, well I'm, I'm mistaken, but the, the, you know I, I would say a lot of perform uh, uh, politics. Uh, is performative with, um, you know, with the Democratic Party, 
they know they don't have to do a whole lot to have the appearance of taking action on certain things. So, you know, in place of, you know, investing heavily in in America's inner cities, you know, you instead have the Speaker of the House wearing kente cloth scarves and talking about racism, right? Or, uh, you know, you can talk a big game uh, on climate change and, and, you know, as long as you spend a, a, a little bit of money, it's going to be more than the Republicans. And that's all you need to do is be better than the Republicans. Um, that kind of transactional politics, I think, is pretty typical. Um, it, in my view, you know, talking to people about Biden, they're they're surprised that he's that he's even taken some of the steps that he has because his his entire career he was a very aggressive sort of deficit hawk uh so the the idea that he would even do something like this uh relief bill just spending the money regardless of what it was on uh is a little bit unusual but at the same time to me it's the same old democratic party i mean look they they're trying to reverse the caps imposed on uh state and local taxes that Donald Trump put in, um, so there, it, which is a gift to the wealthiest, wealthiest taxpayers in, this co- uh, in, the, in the country of about $600 billion over eight years. Um, and they want to do away with it completely, like they're willing to hold up the, uh, the entire relief bill for that. So that tells me that they're, it's kind of the same corporate funded party that it's been for 20 or 25 years now. So um, not terribly surprised by that. And there's a very unique moment where Wall Street wants all this spending. Uh, again, I, in this interview with Bob Poland, you know, he was saying 50 percent of American workers were laid off during this pandemic. And, and Wall Street is, you know, was really freaked out. They want this massive spending. So this the spending they're doing is nothing Wall Street doesn't want. And they're none of them afraid of inflation right now. And so they He's not bucking finance by doing it. I will say there's the odd thing that's going on in some of the appointments that are positive. You might not have seen better than Obama. Uh, and and the one that's I, I, I'm sorry, I forget her name. The, the, the one that just got through the Senate, who's going to be an associate attorney general, the Indian American. Lena Khan. Is that her? Is that her? At the, at the, at the FTC or, or no? Oh, no, attorney general. Uh, she, she's an assistant attorney general, and uh, she, I should know her name. She wrote a tremendous uh, uh, report on the Baltimore police force uh-huh. when, they, when the DOJ stepped in and under Obama and, and said on, uh, maybe a dozen times in the report that every day the constitutional rights of people of Baltimore are being violated. The, the language was very strong. So I, there's, there's some appointments that are kind of better than one expected. On the, on the other hand, the foreign policy so far is, is, is as aggressive as, uh, as one might not hope for. I, it, I would say the foreign policies may be even a little bit more hawkish than, than I expected, but um, domestically they're, you know, they're a little bit, maybe slightly better than I, than I thought. I mean, the, it's still the same campaign that, <laughs> that, that annihilated Sanders last year and went after him as a, um, you know, as a, somebody who was going to bring down the state with his unrealistic ideas. So I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't have a whole lot of expectation for them. But yeah, you know, there, there are a few things that are that are better than terrible uh, about the. the yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm not like I'm not saying they've changed their character. The historical moment is so unique that it's creating some openings. Um, I mean, who they are, I, I think, is who they are. I don't think that's changed. A fair amount of the liberal left is, has been promoting the need for censoring uh, on, uh, you know, the far right. Uh, and I, I think you know that the analysis actually was censored by YouTube. We had one story deleted. Uh, and uh, the reason it was deleted is we had a section in it of Trump speaking to the crowd on January 6th. And the algorithm picks it up and thinks we're promoting Trump, even though the piece was the clip was in there to show, because you know my take has been, the, the January six was the final act of a failed attempted coup by Trump, and so that video got pulled down. So I I put up the same video, somewhat edited, and took out the Trump footage, figuring I could avoid the algorithm, and I guess I did because they left the video up, 
Um, but they banned me from advertising on Google forever. For, forever, I've been banned individually mean. I can't buy ads and promote my stories on YouTube. I've written three times, appealed three times. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the leading lawyers at the ACLU wrote uh, Google on my behalf. They didn't answer. And, I, and, I, and, uh, and it's not just algorithm at this point, because I actually got a letter from somebody saying, we've reviewed the case and our decision stands. Of course, no reason. That's unbelievable. Um, so the, 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 so I'm, the censorship is crazy, um, but I'm a little on the fence in some way on this issue. Um, it, like we have a, in Canada, there's a, a hate law. If you, if you publish language against an identifiable group, ethnic or religious or gender based or sexual, uh, that if you don't have to directly call for violence if that if the hate language is such that it might inspire. And I'm not so sure I'm against that. Um, I, I'm not so sure I'm against the suppression of overtly racist, overtly fascist uh, content. Uh, I, 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 even though I know people like me might get caught in that, I don't. Well, I wouldn't get caught in that. I might have a video that showed one of those things as an example, and then I'd get caught in it. I don't know. What do you think? So uh, I think it's a difficult question, but I, I, I still come down on the side that, um, you know, a lot of the American justices did in cases like, you know, sort of Brandon v. v. Ohio, this idea that you have to protect all that speech as much as you possibly can, because the alternative is worse. Um you know what what you end up risking with that so let's let's just say that you're you're going to have some kind of authority that's either quasi private um or private uh that filters out uh hate speech and has some kind of a system for for locating that and taking it off the internet um already you're going to have a problem we've already seen this everywhere and your, your case is, is 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 an example of this of algorithms and even even human uh, human reviewers not being able to distinguish between covering something uh, and promoting it but even worse than that is the, is the total lack of a process that's transparent and open for how this is done and I think you know in the American system it's it's all been in the open right so we, we do we had a very tightly regulated media landscape. Uh, throughout my entire career, we, you know, you, you can't lie about somebody. You, you can't accuse somebody of a crime that they didn't commit. You can't, you know, libel per se is, is, a, is a very powerful concept where you, you can't even go near a subject that could be ruinous to somebody's career like uh, or life, like, you know, impl implying that they're a pornographer or a pedophile, anything like that. Uh, and that's but it's enforced by a court system. The incitement is in, is enforced by a, a court system. What, the problem with what we're dealing with now is that it's done behind closed doors. It's unilateral. There's no way to appeal, and there's no way to tell whether you're dealing with, um, you know, a private company that's that's acting that way out of its own self interest, or whether it's acting in concert with security agencies who they do already liaise with. We know that. Uh, for intelligence reasons, uh, for uh, you know, it's, you know, for for the for the military, uh, you know the, the the NSA has cooperative agreements. The FBI has cooperative agreements uh, with almost all of these these companies. So it gets very thorny really quickly. Like I, I just I just think it it's going to become a very serious problem. I think something has to be done to clean up all the 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 bad speech that is. Uh, and dangerous speeches that's on the internet, but it can't be this. It can't be a handful of of, of yeah. oligarchical companies just acting without any kind of oversight. Yeah, I, that I agree with completely. I, I was quoting a federal law hate speech, and someone has to be charged. It has to go to court. The person has a right to fight it. Uh, to leave this up to big tech and big tech's connivance with whoever's in power in government at that time, 
that's a fascist. That's another piece of fascization, I think. So that's why when it comes down to, you know, the position you've been advocating and others and uh, critiquing big tech for this, I'm all for that. Uh, but there does to me need to be something, and 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 that something has to have public, a real public process to it. Yeah, I mean, and I I get that. My my. my suspicion about this has been driven the entire time by the the people who are the most aggressive in, in wanting these kind of new censorship rules don't want to do anything to dilute the power of these companies they want to leave those companies as powerful as they uh, as they are and keep the media landscape as concentrated as possible so that it's it's they're able to have this kind of instantaneous lever over over speech that that's what makes me suspicious is they're they're not they're not doing antitrust cases against any of these companies, and yet they're calling them to the hill all the time and asking them to do this or that, which to me sets a bad precedent. Yeah, I agree. It's, a, it's another piece of Mussolini-style corporate fascism. Uh, the, the, these things have grown to such a point, they should be public utilities. And there should be a big national conversation about how to, you know, to what extent they get regulated and how there's public participation. I think the point you just raised is the most important point. This concentration of ownership of of what's become, it's like the education system. Like uh, imagine the entire educational system being privatized and private companies can determine what the curriculum is. Uh, it's at that level. They're, they're, they're so much more powerful now than even the banks are. Um, you know, the, 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 the speed at which they're making money uh, and have political influence and have control over the information landscape is just, it's mind boggling. So yeah, it, it's a, it's a big problem. All right. Well, let's stop here and I hope we do it again soon. Thanks very much, Matt. All right. Thanks a lot, Paul. I really appreciate it. Have Same. a good one. Right. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Please don't forget there's a donate button at the top and a subscribe on YouTube and all that. Mm -hmm.